I'll be uh, presenting on the U.S. Mart Beef Grand Challenge. Go ahead, uh, or the USDA Agricultural Research Service Beef Grand Challenge. Go ahead and advance, Mark. So my outline today, I'll be describing um, the involvement of the Meat Animal Research Center with this ARS Beef Grand Challenge, going over what the purpose of the Grand Challenge program is, uh, an overview of the project overall and the partners that are associated with the challenge, planned collections and a very small status update as a, we, we don't have all the data and so we don't wanna really try to overanalyze too much yet. Go ahead, Mark. So what is a grand challenge? Um, a grand challenge is an ARS uh, program that was developed a few years ago, uh, basically putting out calls for large um, collaborative projects across multiple disciplines to meet multiple goals and sort of moonshot types of goals, um, improving production efficiency, reducing environmental impact, encouraging sustainable production at the same time, and optimizing whole agricultural systems with a real focus on integrated research programs. Next slide. The objective of this particular program when we submitted it then was to provide all segments of beef productions with the genetic and management knowledge to optimize genetic by environment, by management, by product interactions to increase production efficiency with of high quality, safe and healthy beef products with reduced environmental impact. Next slide. So this, uh, this project involves several different locations in the overall Great Plains area of the country, which happens to be the ARS Plains area based out of Fort Collins. Um, the cattle for this project all come from or are sourced at the U.S. Meat Oil Research Center, which you see pointing to the, the little dot in Nebraska there. Um, and cattle are shipped to four different locations, um, Mile City, Montana, the Livestock and Range Research Lab, um, to the Central Plains Experimental Range location in Nun, near Nunn, Colorado, the Rangeland and Pasture Research uh, uh, location near Woodward, Oklahoma, and the Grazing Lands Research Laboratory near El Reno, Oklahoma, and products from this uh, uh, in product stakes and are sent to the Human Nutrition Center in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Next slide. And this is an integrated project, as I mentioned. Uh, those of us at the Mean Hour Research Center, as most of you know, work in a program called Food Animal Production, where we'd be working on genetics, nutrition, reproductive physiology, and product quality um, in, that, in that program. But in addition to that, this involves national programs in human nutrition, uh, food safety, uh, water availability and watershed management and grass forage and rangeland agri-ecosystems. So, so you can see that, that there's a, a, a wide system-wide look at, uh, at this program with, with collaborators from multiple disciplines. Next slide. And the main project that, that gets this uh, program started is a collaborative stalker program to evaluate genotypes, in this case breeds, in multiple environmental and management uh, systems. And this is the first project to establish how we can take advantage of these genetic by environment by management interactions, and hopefully we'll lead to more down the road. Next slide. So the base uh, cattle for this are the germplasm from the germplasm evaluation program. And if, if you've been at BIF and any time, um, hopefully you've heard from this, uh, heard of this program several times. If not, it's the large long-term um, uh, beef cattle uh, breed evaluation program originally. Now we use it as our main uh, genetics resource for those breed differences, as well as heterosis, genetic correlations, uh, uh, specific heterosis, breed specific heterosis, any of those sorts of, of population uh, statistical measures. And we also use it as our main genomics resource in beef cattle on center. Um, it's made up of uh, 18 different breeds of cattle. These are the 18 breeds that are most influential in the United States and have uh, genetic evaluations. We sample representative sires from each of those breeds in concert with lists that were provided by the breed of associations and cross them together um, into purebred back crosses or F1s uh, with, with cows from the same program and uh, end up end up producing purebreds, end up producing crossbreds of each type, 
and work up data to to be able to compare crosses of all these breeds together in steers uh, as terminal progeny or in heifers as a uh, as productive cows of themselves as well as producing purebred bulls that are used in cleanup and full season uh, natural service matings next slide and you'll see we have about 3,500 cows allocated to this project every year. So it's a, it's a sizable project accounting for almost half of our cows on center. Next slide. Um, really quickly, uh, this, is a, uh, this is just an example uh, from a couple of years ago where we were at with, with bulls that were sampled for each breed since 2006. And you'll see we do sample more bulls from the larger registration number breeds in general, but it's not quite proportional. If it were, we'd actually have quite a few more of the larger breeds, especially Angus, and less representation from the smaller breeds than what you see here. So we're actually scaling up a minimum representation of the smaller breeds and capping uh, to no more than around uh, just under 20% of the larger breeds. Uh, as a result. Next slide. And and you've seen this slide before. It comes with the Across Breed EPD program. And, and we produce from this program right now breed differences for the, the some of the main EPD traits every year. Uh, these are breed of sire differences, actually. So the, the difference is one half of a full breed difference. It's how much you'd expect from using one sire versus another on a common cow. And, and these data then give an idea for producers of, of where their breeds are and what are their strengths and weaknesses, what can they be working on, or what can commercial producers be adding to their portfolio if they want to. Uh, these, are, these are very useful as a result. But the hard thing about this is these traits are primarily based on, on means from the production system we have at the Mean Animal Research Center. So that's part of why I wanna start looking and see if breeds continue to rank consistently if we take them to other production systems. Next slide. So that's really the grand, the purpose of the Grand Challenge Project in a nutshell is to have breeds of sires and large size families evaluated at multiple locations and management systems and to utilize females from GPE uh, program made it do uh, pure to bred bulls in order to achieve this goal. Next slide. And, and it's a pretty simple crossing strategy overall. Um, we can't represent all 18 breeds in a program like this. So we're focusing on the largest four in terms of registration, Angus, Herford, Simmental, and Charlet, as well as looking at bulls from, uh, from American composites, uh, Brahmin composites, preferentially Brangus with some beef master we've had to use in there. Those five breed types are being mated to our base cows and we, we are expecting to be able to have contrast from each location with enough bulls uh, representative of each breed and enough, and enough progeny from each breed to be able to uh, see what the Angus, Hereford, Simmental, Charlet and Brahmin composite differences are from each other within each location and thus be able to see if, if their interaction, if, if there's an interaction or re-ranking among the locations. Next slide. So this is really the program then and what we're doing. And, and it looks really simple on a single slide, but this actually takes quite a bit of work and agreements and everything else to try to figure out when and how to transfer cattle to other locations, even within the same USDA program of, of the Agricultural Research Service. Essentially, in the spring-born calves, uh, we'll uh, wean those calves in early October and send, uh, for four years, the plan has been to send 120 head to ARS locations I mentioned earlier in Miles City, Montana and El Reno, Oklahoma, while keeping calf feds uh, in dry lot at, uh, of the same number at, at the U.S. Mineral Research Center. In the fall, um, the locations are a little bit smaller and can't, can't have as many stock or progeny. So we're sending around 40 head to each of the two locations in the fall to Nunn, Colorado and Woodward, Oklahoma, while keep around 40, keeping around 40 here at, at Clay Center, Nebraska as well. And those typically ship a little later after weaning and uh, weanings in February. Those typically ship in uh, April or May, whereas the others ship in either October right after weaning or just early November.
to El Reno, Oklahoma. And the goal then is to try to make sure that we're keeping genetic contributions as similar as possible across the locations to increase the strength of our contrast. So we do parentage testing to see which natural service bulls we turned into the cow groups are actually producing the progeny and split those progeny groups up across locations. So that representation within each year from each sire and breed are fairly consistent as consistent as we can make them with each location. So we're trying to essentially send half sibs. If there's three half sibs, we're trying to send, send two away and keep one at the Mean Owl Research Center. As a secondary objective to balance, we're trying to keep the dam breed contribution as consistent as possible. That's much more difficult with the with the way our crossbred herd works, but but as well as we can, we're, as a secondary objective, we're trying to make sure we're not overrepresenting the dam breed in one location or another. So in, in terms of how are these really different from each other, we're getting environmental interactions just by going to different places, but the environment's really confounded with the, the localities management system and the management systems that are being chosen are representative of the management systems for that region. So here in, in Nebraska, we do a lot of backgrounding on dry lots, uh, corn belt country, of course, and, uh, and cattle are often fed as calf feds with backgrounding after weaning for a few months and put on full feed for a long duration uh, finishing program. In Miles City, Montana, the program instead is to put those, those on a really a long yearling program, if you will, put them on winter range and on a slow gain as long as possible. And then, and then when the snow becomes prohibitive, take them to a dry lot and you transition from a background in the dry lot to full feed, depending on where the cats are and their the calves are in, in their maturity. El Reno, uh, if you know anything about Oklahoma, has a lot of wheat grazing in that area. So those stalkers are put on wheat pasture and put in the feedlot later in the spring when the wheat pasture is uh, ready to be uh, ready to start growing on its own. Um, and then the, the two smaller locations are both summer stalker programs on range for their environment, short grass on in Colorado and mid grass on Woodward, Oklahoma. So the main question then is are the top performing breeds and sires, if possible, consistent under different management programs and environments, and, and sub-treatments are then applied in, in rain situations in some cases. So, so there's some, some places where some of the locations might be feeding a supplement or might be changing, looking at treatments for stocking rate to see which stocking rates might be the most advantageous. Uh, we're okay with that. We just wanna account for those extra treatments within the whole study. And then, and then uh, make sure that each location is trying to collect a common set of production measures that we can compare across locations as well as possible. So this is a summary of the basic production traits we're really trying to collect with the program. Um, every location is trying to get a 28-day, approximately monthly wait, on whether they're in their backgrounding or their finishing phase, um, to, to assess uh, gain differences over time. Um, we're attempting on the finishing ration to keep energy constant and protein sufficient. Um, protein can be higher in one location or another as long as energy is fairly constant, but as long as, as protein is not limiting. Um, we're trying to estimate feed usage, uh, cost of the feed and days on feed to look at um, economic advantages among the locations. And then we're, we're targeting a finish weight in each location. We agreed on a 1350 pound steer finish weight, uh, realizing that not necessarily everybody in every system is gonna be the same level of, of finish or marbling at that phase or fat deposition at that phase. But we're trying to keep our, our comparison as fair as possible. And given that this is a, a wide genetic base anyway, we're going to have a lot of variation in, in both weight and in, in finishing uh, from a project like this, like we do with the germ plasma evaluation program, even looking at it at Clay Center alone. We collect uh, data from standard camera and uh, weight data at harvest, hawk carcass weight, marbling yield, 
And also we're buying back stakes to look at tenderness, uh, color stability, and dark cutting. In addition to production measures, we're adding a few other, other things that we're tracking um, in the spring cooperating groups. Uh, we're, sam- we're subsampling a group of cattle to look at uh, rumen fluid, to look at metagenome differences between the systems, basically what kind of bacterial taxa groups are there. Uh, and, uh, and with the hypothesis that these cattle all started in the same place, we know that diets cause animals to diverge into different uh, bacterial rumen content. And so going to these other locations, we expect these half sibs to diverge. And then the question is, do they con- convert, converge again when they get on a finishing ration? We're also looking at stress across the production systems and using cortisol as a proxy from hair, fecal samples, and from blood, with each of those being a different measure of cortisol, hair being long-term chronic stress potential, and blood being a, a short-term stress and, and fecal in between. Um, we're with the with the and with the Human Nutrition Center in North Dakota, we're looking at uh, fatty acid profiles as well as other health benefit measures, uh, protein content, et cetera, realizing that, that even if we were able to change the fat profiles to all positive polyunsaturated fats in, in our beef, uh, the human diet in the United States would still be getting most of their saturated fats from non-animal sources and uh, and we probably wouldn't make a big impact on that from that alone. So uh, emphasizing, like we talked about this morning in the main session, emphasizing the positive health benefits from beef and, and what we're getting from these systems is, is, a, is another objective there. And then we have some food safety objectives to see this moving around in these backgrounding systems may change the shedding. Uh, by looking at pin surfaces of E. coli 15787 or salmonella or antimicrobial resistant bugs. So environmental impacts um, on the uh, on the on the range are also being looked at. Remember, I said this is a multidisciplinary project and and different locations. This is at primarily at Nun, Colorado, are are, are looking at um, differences between populations and and grazing densities and whether that affects carbon sequestration through soil analysis, as well as monitoring changes in the forage quality and production and plant composition. And, uh, and so they're looking at those stocking treatment differences, as well as looking at cattle from other sources and sort of including Colorado State and local, local breeders to see if stocking densities with those different sources of cattle cause differences in, in forage production and, and carbon sequestration. Next slide. Other environmental impacts in other locations, um, Al Reno in Oklahoma is looking at indirect methane message, measurement through supplemental feeders that measure methane and uh, using, and then also uh, Woodward, Oklahoma is using results uh, with body weight gain to model uh, metabolizable energy intake on their range. They'll be combined with tracking collars um, in, in some locations to assess rumination, grazing activity, um, and, and things like that. So, um, so the overall project summary, I won't get into this. This is too tight to really read, but the, the, the kind of direction here is cattle raised in the upper left at Clay Center and transferred after weaning to other locations either in range in the bottom left or, or uh, wheat pasture in the bottom right or backgrounding in the upper right, and then trying to measure several of these samples that are being collected in each place, as well as looking at, at interactions within the locations that, that are favorable to the, to the national programs in, in sustainability and forage production in those areas. Next slide. And the overall goal is even more complicated. Um, the, the, the key thing here, and again, we'll go deep into this, but this is, this, it gets really complicated when you think about systems and what things are going on in the interactions between soil, forage, and, and the animals themselves and the end product with, with, the, uh, with the steaks that people are eventually eating. So the main, the main take home here is, is we really need to try to dive into this deeper with more collaborations and develop beef 
cooperations among our ARS and university colleagues that do a better job across disciplines of, of tracking the interactions among the real system and where are our, our changes in soil type affecting the forage and the animal and what are the feedbacks that change the soil soil quality. So, so uh, this is a long-term goal. It's a lofty goal, but this is just a scratching the surface on where we want to be able to take our beef systems research as, as an organization and hopefully with a lot of collaborators in the future. So, so far um, we've had sent three sets of cattle born in fall 2020 to, uh, to all of the spring locations uh, uh, right now in, in, in April and sorry, in the, in the, get shipped to in the spring. So the third, third set of cattle are now at Nunn and at Woodward and the third set of cattle, the third year of cattle is also in El Reno and Mile City right now and were shipped last October, November. The 2020 spring, 2021 spring calves are born. We just sampled them for genotyping. So we'll start sorting them into weaning groups in, uh, in October. And fall cattle are bred now with year four calves. So basically the, the, we're coming to the end of the breeding part of our program, but there's still a lot of data co to collect right now. And we're making up with some, some loss of data in some cases due to COVID. Uh, primarily at plants. Next, um, just some early results. Um, sticking, I'm emphasizing the spring herds on these results right now. And and again, these are early, so I don't want you to take too much for this. But a take home here is that uh, backgrounding on the dry lot is is probably the highest. But but animals do really well on peat re pasture and achieve similar gains with some composition maybe in the heifers on uh, on their finishing ration when they come into the feedlot on uh, on the wheat pasture. So end up with fairly similar grains in those two systems. Uh, not surprisingly, the winter range in Mile City, the bottom row, uh, we had some very, very small gains uh, before snow came along and, and make a whole lot more comp compensatory gain uh, with those once we get into uh, the feeding phase. Next slide. Uh, marbling. Um, this this isn't necessarily consistent year to year. We we uh, the first year we went on we went in dry lot a lot faster at Mile City the third line, and they ended up doing uh, better on marbling overall uh, with these marbling scores. Um, we hadn't we have some delays in the marbling on the the El Reno one on the next year, but you'll see that that marbling uh, benefit kind of goes away, and that's partly because the animals stayed on winter range longer in Mile City last year than this year. Um, some early results from the from the locations in the fall herd, from the fall herd cooperators, you'll see that uh, that in general, um, marbling seemed to be doing pretty well down at Woodward at the bottom, maybe not quite as good in Colorado, but probably not significantly different from each other. Next slide. And, uh, uh, fat is consistent with marbling. I won't spend too much time on that. It basically trends right with marbling. Next slide. Tenderness is not really a concern in any of these, if, but we do see a, a slight trend with some of the grazing programs maybe being a little less tender in the first year, maybe in the second year on the winter range than the ones that are on dry lot the whole time. Um, we'll see how this shakes out as it goes forward. Definitely want more data before we make any claim. One take home here, these are not Warner Bachelor shear forces, they're Sly shear forces. So these numbers, if they're below um, early 20s, are, are all acceptable. So there's not anything scary here, um, but, but we do see some and, and you realize there could be a distribution here. We'll want to look at this more carefully. Next slide. So future thoughts, as I hinted at, um, this Docker program is just the beginning and, and complicated to get pulled off, I realize, but we need to continue to focus on the impacts of cattle genetics on range condition, carbon cycle, and soil interactions, and nutrient recovery overall, and what can we do to, to do a better job of that with, with these large beef systems. And then we also need to look at the impact of systems on animal health and welfare. And that, that cortisol uh, is a beginning of this. We could probably do a bit more and, and continue to sell what are the good ways that our, our products being raised all around the country. 
we need to examine um, interactions as our next step also with the animal side on heifer development and cow productivity. And, and that sounds easy. That's a whole lot more complicated, but that's probably where the money really is with this. If we're thinking about the genetic interactions, we should try to explain long term is, is what are the differences in adaptability on the cow herd? Next slide. And so uh, in conclusion, this is the beginning of a large project to increase efficiency and adaptability in beef cattle. We hope there's a lot of opportunities to grow here, as I just mentioned, and, uh, and we want to increase the use of these integrated systems and management to increase our research utility and hopefully eventually to increase uh, efficiency in the overall U.S. cow herd. Next slide. Just want to acknowledge all the cooperators at the locations. These are the leads at the locations. There's a whole lot of technicians and then additional scientists at each locations that I'm not recognizing here. And then uh, we've had help from universities. Uh, Mark knows about this from Colorado State, uh, helping us feed cattle out. Uh, Kansas State also arranged to feed out cattle from Woodward. And Oklahoma State is feeding out cattle that, uh, that are on the uh, wheat pasture at El Reno. Lots of people at the Meow Research Center I want to recognize that are working in other science areas or in, uh, in uh, technical support, cattle support, and so forth. So I want to thank all the folks that are on this. There's way more than I can name here on one slide. Next slide. And with that, uh, I'll let Mark call me again, and we'll try to answer any questions. All right, Mark. Okay, yep. Yeah, I, I didn't want to go too deep into it yet because I don't want to say something deep different yet, Allison. So I'm, I'm trying to avoid being too much with standard errors at the moment. I, I just don't want to take home too much until the project's done. So I'm hedging on that. Um, but in terms of uh, in terms of in right now, um, that's that's two years of data on the gains um, would be around uh, 240, 250 head each at those spring locations. Um, around 40 and then on the on the other ones they're broken down to a single year so there'll be at about 120 head on the spring locations and about 40 head on the fall locations since they were broken out by year oh I apologize so Allison was asking <laughs> asking you can't mic up at the same time right uh, Allison was asking what the standard errors and what the N was for those tables. So 120 head per year in the locations that are spring and 40 head in the fall. 